Awesome. And before I get started here, I do just want to say, I asked Bishop, uh, Father Martin to come and, and say that. And I asked Bishop Polmeyer to come and, and paint the vision. And, and the two knew that what they were presenting. And so that blessing has been conferred. I realize that everyone has a different pasture and a different maybe way of thinking. There's not a, a clear black and white yet. And I don't think there ever has been in the church. And what Mr. Ernie had just said, that's what the bishop said today. Is we don't have, you know, red and blue says, oh, press button A and we, we have your solution. And it, it doesn't come easy. It comes through much restraint and discernment and uh, confrontation. And, uh, and so our particular pastors, we have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be confrontational. But I look at it as a way to evangelize and invite my pastor into this ministry and let him know what we're dealing with and how he can help or hinder the ministry. Um, and so always with charity, which I need the most practice in. <laughs> awesome. Well, I will get started here today. First of all, again, for all of you who have come today and who are back there still getting processed and getting ready to, to get into this ministry, I thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for our brothers and sisters uh, that are inside of these institutions. Uh, what an what a amazing ministry it is. And before I get into more of myself and uh, what it is, what the heck we're doing here, share with you again a little bit more of the jail and prison ministry vision statement which is in alignment with the, the vision of Jesus Christ, vision uh, of the diocese that they all may, may be one. If you look at the, the diocesan website, the vision statement says that they all may be one. Well, the problem is in jail and prison ministry, we see that there is a, a intentional separation from those inside and those outside. And so our vision statement is that we may all be one. Those of us on the outside and those of us on the inside. Scripture says, where there is no vision, people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. So some of you are asking, what the heck am I doing here? How the heck did I get involved in jail, in prison, ministry? Why am I at this conference? And it's a great question. And we will, uh, we will dig into that uh, in a little bit here, just one more time, share here the, vision, uh, the mission statement of our diocese. To bear the burdens of the least brothers and sisters of Christ by sharing of our time, talents, or treasure, demonstrating our union in Christ by whose grace restores human dignity, or for the very first time allows the men and women affected by incarceration to experience the true love of God who never stops seeking them. Today we'll discover a lot. We ask how we got here. And I think the question is, where else did we expect to be? I would say the big reason we are where we are today is because we did not heed the warnings of John Paul II, Pope, uh, sorry, St. John Paul II, about the United States of America. We did not heed the warnings of Mother Teresa about the United States of America, about our hedonistic and materialistic culture, how we are willing to throw away life for a better job, for a better vehicle, for more fun times, for me to spend my monetary things at. And, and now I know what all of you are thinking. Wait, am I at a pro-life conference? I thought this was jail and prison ministry. <laughs> to which I say, amen, because this is a pro-life issue. I grew up in a very devout home. Dad was on fire about this man, and so was I. This guy, I mean, it was cool to be Catholic. How cool was John Paul II, St. John Paul II? One of his sayings, as the family goes, so goes the nation and the whole world. 
along with that, a similar saying, as the church goes, so goes the nation. You know, for centuries, the church led the people how we were to be and changed civilizations. And it seems as of late and the warnings based on what John Paul II was sharing, that if we did not change our ways, we would fall. And it's been this. And since the 60s, we've had a division in the family, a disruption in the family. Through contraception, we've had an increase in unchastity, an increase in unwanted pregnancies, which leads to an increase in divorce, which leads to an increase of homes without both a mother and a father figure, which leads to an increase of, if my f earthly father fails me and failed me, how can I love my heavenly father? to the hatred of fathers and, and family, to what happens to these children who don't grow up in a devout home with a loving mother and father, who go after every other idol in the world, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that has plagued now our prison systems. And so we're all asking that question, how do we end up here? And it's because there's no other place to end up. Once you take God out of the beginning and you see the destruction of all those other cycles of the family life, there is no other place for us to end up. You say, well, what qualifies me? Well, nothing other than I have a heartbeat. I grew up in this devout home. My dad was very involved in the works of mercy, served as soup kitchens, did youth ministry, everything. Uh, that was the home environment I grew up in. But I was in the secular world. I went to a secular school, played secular sports. How many in here learned to put a condom on and, uh, at the age of... Uh, second or third grade, your school taught you that. Anybody else? Your school teaching you how to do that. What grade is that? Second, third, fourth grade. You say this is blatant, but how else could we be where we're at today if we weren't in the secular world? And so we say, church is over there on Sunday, but we can go about the rest of our life and expect we go about the rest of our life and end up in the promised land. <laughs> it don't work that way. And so our society is a result of what we've been doing. I had my own walk in sin. I was very blessed uh, to have my grounding in faith. I met my wife at college. She wasn't born and raised Catholic, but she was a saint. And she's been sanctifying me every day since. <laughs> Thanks be to God. I don't know a better person. She was a better practicing Catholic than I was. We fell in love together in the church. I got to go through our city with her. Get re-evangelized. And... In all of that, by the way, I'm still in confession at least once a week. No, but once a month at least. Because I need it, because I'm a sinner. Because what I merit, what I discovered back then, and what I share with my brothers and sisters on the inside, when they ask me, why are you here? Why do you visit us? Because this is what I merit. That without Christ, this is what I'm responsible for. But he paid the price that I might live.
And so it calls me, I fell in love early with the sacrament of reconciliation. Not because I looked forward to going or not because I was happy with my sin, because the grace I received in the sacrament and how it transformed me and still transformed me every day. The saints talk about grace upon grace. I fell in love with our sacraments. And so the, 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 the issue that we have seen is not only just a pro-life issue, but going back to JP2, was his encyclicals on Humanae Vitae, the theology of the body, which I depended on for so many years and still do. I love the theology of the body. I built my life on training the body. And I fell in love. I, I, I found a passion in tra training and pursuing my body for fear of having preached to others, I myself should be found disqualified. In that, I started training other people. I started teaching. I saw how this broken world, the men figures in my life were in secular jobs, torn, pulled by secular ideologies, and divided between how they're out there and what they go do the one hour a week at church. And so I had created a program. And one of the, the centers of the program, so, you know, if, you, if any of you know workout uh, terminology, the WAD is the workout of the day, all right? So we were doing a VOD, which was the verse of the day. And that verse of the day is aligned with the virtue of the week, okay, which is our vow. So we always had a vow. Our workout was an act of prayer, inspired actions, dedicated to intentions, greater than self. But the one that kept slapping me in the face was our monthly mission. The monthly mission I could hit pretty often. But every, for two years straight, when I was doing our monthly mission, they were the works of mercy. But visit the imprisoned kept coming up. And I had no idea where to start. I had no idea how to access the prison. I didn't know anybody doing it. When I first retired football, I got invited uh, by somebody in Kairos to go do a Kairos prison ministry retreat. But there was an eight week formational process that I couldn't give my yes to that. I just retired football, I'm broke. You know, I'm, I got 11 kids. <laughs> I don't got time for that. I wanna go serve. And so that was an eyesore and, uh, or my pain point. And in that discernment, started looking at, uh, I had, our family had been invited to uh, become full-time missionaries in Peru by another Catholic family who had seven children who had sold all their possessions. And we were looking at her like, this is heroic. How awesome would this be? And yet realizing the whole upside down world that would, that would be. And then the world shut down. And in that world shutting down, as we were just discussing, a lot of our parishes stopped being able to give the Eucharist. And so we're seeking, we're asking, we're not, first of all, the world shut down, that meant closure on wanting to become full-time missionaries, at least for that time. And as we're church hopping, trying to find somebody that believes what we believed about the Eucharist, as we were searching, I ended up with St. Joseph's. And I heard old Deacon Corky up there talking about jail and prison ministry. Heard an announcement, saw an announcement just like this about what we're doing inside the prisons as soon as they open the doors. So even the jails and prisons shut down, locked all the uh, visitors out. But my wife and I on opposite ends of the pew looked at each other and I think that might be for us. So we started praying and discerning. And it really was. I was a pro-life advocate. I'm a guy who got canceled, okay, as a professional athlete. Um, and I don't need to go into all that today, but I've never been shy about my faith. And pro-life was a, something I really stood for with my family uh, to the point of uncomfort. Um, and I was a CFLPA representative. And so it made it even all the more comfortable because I had to have the hard discussions with my coach. 
I ain't going to that meeting. And you can't force me and you can't force them. <laughs> that doesn't go over too well. I got traded 10 days later. <laughs> but I had a hard time with perceiving what I was doing in the jails and prisons. Because I have a lot of anger towards evil, bad, bad stuff that happens. Going back to that picture, I mean, you saw the Jaguars picture. There's some thugs in there. I play with a lot of thugs. Good brothers, though. Good people. A lot of good people also. Many of them would sit there and tell you that had I not found this pathway out of the streets, this pathway out of my gang, I would have been dead or in jail. And this was their way out. And many of you can tell similar stories in your work path, someone you came across, military especially, they were on the road to nowhere. And thanks be to God for the military. And so I heard this announcement. We were praying and discerning. And it didn't take long for me. I signed the application. My very first drive was with Deacon Corky. Met him at St. Joe's. We rode out together, praying a rosary. Holy cow, is this awesome. We're not even in the prison yet. Just talking about what we're going to go do. And then we get to Florida State Prison, which is a crazy place. And we'll get to that in a second. Meeting a team of brothers from all over the diocese who are going to serve these people. Praying again. Uh, I can't remember if there was a priest or... But we had uh, some of us even received the recon uh, reconciliation with Father Richard, I believe, that was there that day. Before we go on and to minister uh, to these fellows at Florida State Prison. That was an unbelievable experience. Here's my wonderful, crazy, beautiful family. But the predicament was, as I was going through this and we had this experience, was, is prison ministry for us? Because I'm leaving these guys and I'm going into a harsh environment. But we had to have the real discussion is, are we just pro-baby? We've said we were pro-life all these years. We're doing some of these other works of mercy, but I haven't been inside a jail or a prison. And for some reason, for two years straight, when that thing came, I, I didn't find my way in. And then through prayer and discernment, and that slapping me in the face saying, well, yeah, if you don't go, you are just pro-baby. <laughs> and so we took the leap of faith and it has not let us go. Had an amazing experience, got to for several uh, months. Drive all over with Deacon Corky as, we, uh, as I got to just get my hands and, and feel for what this jail and prison ministry was all about and meeting so many of you guys uh, way back then to see your hearts and, and how it transformed me. Here is a picture of Florida State Prison. So this was our, my first visit. This is not from us there. We don't get cameras in there. You know, we, uh, yeah, yeah, it, uh, it, this is exactly what it looks like, though, at Florida State Prison. They got 15 wings of three floors. And there are 30-plus cells on each floor. 38 to 36, something like that. And what I can tell you is in that first experience, my encounter with Jesus Christ. How... I got, I've met people in there, more realer people in there who are hungrier for the Lord than us in the quote unquote free world. Goes back to what Bishop Holmeyer was saying. Is freedom really free if we are consumed with our electronics, consumed with materialism, and consumed with all the things that we can be consumed with? Am I free? Meanwhile, I have brother in here who should be in the worst place in the entire world and he's asking, seeking, and knocking. He can't wait for the sacraments. 
How on fire was that? To be able to go and visit people that want to hear about the Lord. And, but not only that, they want to tell you about their experiences. Same place. I don't know if anybody else remembers or met him, but there's a, a fella there who showed me his incredible invention of a powerless, meaning he doesn't have to provide a power, I think water, generator that he invented, that his mother is living on somewhere in, in Mexico. And not only that, but the entire community, he's providing energy for that. And he showed me overlay after overlay, this amazing art, these beautiful minds of the humans that are inside our institutions. I couldn't wait to keep going back and talking to that fella. There's another guy who always said that he, he belonged to this parish. I think this is one of many, but uh, he was an old veteran. The most devout Catholic I ever saw. He's a veteran. He was in war and he, he can't not get in bar fights. You probably know who I'm talking about, but I mean, he had story after story and some of them were out in right field, but I couldn't wait to encounter that guy every week that we go. He finally did regain his freedom. I haven't seen him here yet. Haven't, don't know where he, where he ended up, but I hope to see him because he's my brother. Over on death row, one of the longest living people on death row over this last year and a half, we finally brought into the Catholic church. Was never Catholic, but six months ago, eight months ago, got baptized and confirmed in the Catholic church. Now that experience was unbelievable because here's the whole process. First of all, these guys are in death row, which is a different population than uh, another close confinement pro uh, population. Then there's a general population. There's a work camp. So there's several locations. You're going through gate to fence to gate, all these things. But to get this man confirmed, he's on death row. And they treat these guys, this guy is in his 90s, you know, 70s for sure. Cuff like this, cuff like this. He can only move two inches at a time. They have to get him from there to the chapel. I'm telling you, this guy I've never seen not smiling ear to ear. This guy, the most unbelievable conversations <laughs> of our Lord uh, that I've ever had. But he, he makes you smile because he's joy filled and he pours it into his brother inmates. So he gets dragged over there. But here's the deal. Three guards had to bring him who are not Catholic. And they don't realize that our baptisms and confirmations are a mass. So now they're coming for a mass and they have to sit there through the whole thing. You can kind of see a couple of these rolling their eyes and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, planting that seed even in those people is what we get to do. And the conversations I've had with those guys ever since, one of them I met at three different executions this year. I'll get into that in just a second. But the very first, first time I saw this guy, the, the hardest looking guy in there, you could tell didn't want to be there. Man, I ain't never been to a Catholic mass. That was interesting. You know, <laughs> he just goes on to that. But most people haven't. If you are raised Protestant, protest the Catholic church, you probably haven't ever been in one or experienced what we get to experience at the holy sacrifice of the mass. And so that experience was unbelievable. Um, there is the sadness, right? And here's where we have to be loud and proud about our Catholic faith because we aren't red and blue. We're Catholic. Those parties aren't the easy button and they both lie. We got one says I'm pro-life. Miss Christine, she might be back there. Hey. We talk about pro-life, and on one end we say we're pro-life, meaning pro-baby, but we signed seven executions, eight executions this year. That ain't pro-life. 
And we got another a president saying, well, he didn't say he's pro-life. In fact, he's doing the opposite. But they might fight for this side of life a little bit more. Both, both deceive you. They deceive us. Catholic is the way, the truth, and the life. And so that's been some incredible experiences. I know there was one other guy I wanted to share with you. Oh, Father Martin. So this one time we were at uh, Florida State Prison again. And just the way the conversation came up. First of all, this guy is a revert to the Catholic Church. Or I can't even remember if he just found it. But it was someone who was doing what we were doing, ministering to these fellows, had the secrets of the rosary book. And on the, on the cover of that is a picture of Mary. And he's asking, who is that? And he's telling us his story. And once they rec tell him that it's the Virgin Mary, goes on to his story. He had a drowning story. He was drowning in a spring in Florida and was missing for like 20 minutes. And his brother or his uncle, was, I was Father Martin was here because he's got the details also, was swimming, looking for him and to the point where they think he's gone. Meanwhile, his experience was the mother Mary, this woman who he saw, who he didn't know who she was, saved him from this drowning experience, lifted him out and brought him to this, this place of refuge and before they realized that he's not drowned. But that experience, having someone come in and, and talk about this with him, he has been on the process of becoming Catholic. I went on to some of the art, but again, the skills that these uh, fellas, men and women, get to hone into because of their newfound time. We're all in this rat race, but now that they're out of the rat race, they're honing skills that they never got to harness. And the amazing art and things that these people do is unbelievable. The talent that is there. And so, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir on some of this, but for those of you who are new and, and considering, holy cow, I can't wait for you to meet your brothers and sisters in Christ. This here is a, a, a mass Bishop Estevez did at our general pop at Union Correction. This is a 55 and older population there. Again, people don't know, and, and we just get used to saying certain things, but two weeks ago, I was leaving from here to go to Mass with Father Martin. And as I'm getting one of the people I'm after Mass with over there, says, oh, I'm sorry, you gotta go do that. And I had to turn around and say, sorry, what do you mean? I get to go have another mass with my brothers who are more devout than most of the men at this parish. I'm just being honest. They don't miss. And so, not only that, they're praying for me. They, they, they can't wait for me to be there. And they, they, they show up relentlessly because they can't re wait to receive the Lord. Here's the problem. Our jail population in the 17 counties in Florida is about 7,000 people. Our prison population is 22,000 people. Now this is what we know. There are places like Core Civic and other private institutions that have other. So we have over 30,000 people incarcerated in just our diocese alone. That 30,000 inmates means 30,000 broken families. 30,000 broken families means 30,000 hurting communities. Of the people that are incarcerated, 14% of them are Catholic. So, I had to do the math. I use a calculator. I'm not that good at it. But that is 4,200 Catholics in our diocese that are incarcerated. That doesn't mean they're necessarily practicing. That means they were born and raised Catholic. They're on a Catholic identity. 
The most, the more alarming number is 20, of all the declines of people in faith in prison, Catholicism is declining at the highest rate at 20%. The next closest, I think, was Mormons at 11%. There aren't very many Mormons in our institutions here. This is a, yeah, this is a problem in the world, but it's also a problem in our institutions. And I know as I, we've talked to Vision with Bishop Pohlmeyer, the, that verse, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. There, of anywhere in the entire world, I am convinced if we want to bring people to Jesus Christ, if we want to bring people to the Catholic Church, there is no place else in the world where people are more hungry, who are seeking, asking, and knocking. And that reminds me of the story of Jesus going to the tombs. Maybe we don't want that. Maybe our fear gets in the way of what that could mean. Because if we went and ministered to these 30,000 people, like we believed in what we were ministering about and what we believed in their human dignity and we believed in their potential, we would set the world on fire. We would absolutely set it on fire. But like the people in the tomb or the man in the tomb who was, it's not about flesh and blood. That person was in the tombs because of what he did physically, because of the crimes he committed. He was chained there. But then they weren't blanketed with this deception or this veil of, oh, it's just a, he's just evil. No, it's a power and principality. Jesus says, it's not about flesh and blood, it's about powers and principalities. And Jesus, with his mercy, goes to the men in the tomb, cast out the demoniac, for we are many, and restores this man back to his community. What'd they do to Jesus? What's that? They kick, kicked him out. Scared the heck out of him. They didn't want this man back in society because they see only the flesh and blood, not the powers and the principalities. They did kill all their pigs. That's right. We have an awesome opportunity here to go and love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but not only us. The ones here today are in it. We get to go and invite others into this wonderful ministry. It's our diocese. You guys see the map there? It just displays, there's where all our parishes are, okay? Most of our institutions are out here. There's where a majority of our population is. Every county has a jail. There are 38 institutions. You say, there aren't 38 stars. Well, several of those institutions have multiple institutions within. 67 parishes in our diocese. Okay? Um, you'll see the parish involvement right now. What I know, again, it's not fair because there's a lot of people, laborers in the harvest that I don't know. But what I know is there's 20 parishes involved of 67. So we can do a lot better there. From that... We know the percentage of those parishioners involved of that parish is, is few. So we can do better on both ends. This, we're going to go over there uh, as well, okay? A lot of what I'm sharing today is how we can all help one each other more. Okay, so the boards app will have every resource that you guys need for jail and prison ministry. Uh, it will be a tool for... Uh, you are inviting someone else into the ministry. You want to get them the application. It's all right there. Uh, they want to know, uh, you know, which chapel, uh, chaplain to get in touch with, with what institution, uh, et cetera. What I have little information on is our jails because each jail and its sheriff has its own unique system. So it's a little tougher boat. And so those of you who are here in jail ministry today and can give us some insight as to your jail's process, and if there's someone here that can join you in that, we'd love to take that. Um, but we got online support. Uh, we even have a place for donation. 
I would love to be doing more of these. Because when we come together, <laughs> just like the fellows from Trinity Rescue Mission out here, with community, I can do all things. When I'm isolated and alone and doing this ministry on my own, it gets a little harder. And so my, my hope is that we just have a lot more collaboration in what we're doing. These are several of the parishes involved. If you don't see your parish up there, let me know. I hope you signed in, uh, put the information back there. I knew St. Michael's was in there, and there you are right there. Here's some of the fruits of labor. Again, they don't let us bring cameras. This was a pain in the rear end just to get this permission for these pictures. There are so much more joyous moments that I know all of you are getting to have with your, uh, with your people. But this brings to life the humanity behind this term we're calling jail and prison ministry. We are serving humans who are endowed with grace, endowed with being created in the image and likeness of God. We talked a lot about today uh, the rescue missions, the uh, halfway houses. I'm not going to go much more into that other than we're addressing that. And one of the things we got coming up here, okay, and it's in your packet, okay, set your date. Good Friday is going to be our first attempt at a big fundraiser get together for jail and prison ministry. First of all, there is no greater story in salvation history and the passion of Christ. There is no greater movie to depict that story in history. And what an opportunity to evangelize and get people out to go watch The Passion of Christ on Good Friday, 3.30 p.m. at uh, Epic Theaters in St. Augustine, Florida. Okay, so same, these are some of the things. I have a meeting here in the next two weeks at St. Joseph House in Tallahassee to start figuring out what we got to do, how, the how-tos as far as Catholic halfway houses in our diocese. But in agreement with Bishop Estevez, right now we don't have to invent the wheel today because there are places that are out there that we can be sending people to. And yet, we've got to have funding to help support these places. Barry, one of the things he would have said today, the uh, director for there, is they need $12,000 for a freezer. People are donating food, but their freezer went bad, and their food keeps going. They need, uh, now they have enough residents to store the food, for, but they're having to throw out food. It's different things like that with their building structures that they need help in funding. We also, uh, September 21st, mark it in your calendar. It's in your packet. Mark it in your calendar will be our next retreat. David, you here? David helped us get that place at St. Catherine's. Okay, David is our, our faithful guy. He does also Cairo's prison ministry, but he uh, is very faithful to uh, serving the folks at Florida State Prison and, uh, and offered his, uh, his parish a great central location for, for all of us in uh, the diocese. A couple of initiatives. You guys don't know this because we haven't had much news media. You know, I just started a social media account. I don't do a lot on social media, but we're trying to. Anyway, fourth annual, we had our fourth annual Nights on Bikes this year. That's uh, somebody, if, if that's something you want to get involved, if you're a motorcycle rider, or you know motorcycle riders, and they want to get involved in supporting, this is something they've been doing now four straight years. They start at one location, they drive by, pray the rosary at both Florida State Prison and at Death Row, and then they go uh, on, on a ride. But they uh, raised, I believe it was three or $4,000 this year for, for the diocesan prisoner. Yes, yes, praying the rosary at, at each location. Thank you guys so much. Um, the last thing, or last couple of things here. I keep getting feedback, you know, 
about support or questions and all this kind of stuff. And what all I'm here to do is not to tell anybody how to do it. Your th oh my gosh. The, I could not believe the laborers in the harvest here today. And the beautiful ministries, Mary Tucker can't say enough again about your program. And um, for those who are just looking into this ministry and want to go have an unbelievable experience, I would tell you to start there because this humble woman has, has been doing an unbelievable program at Columbia Correctional for years now. And anywhere from six to 12 people she brings into the Catholic faith every year. Baptizing confirmation. I mean, that is unbelievable. It's, it's, it's awesome. But for us to be in communion with one another, I'm offering a Zoom meeting every fourth Thursday of the month. This week, uh, that would be a little quick. So I'm going, this is the first, thir first one. We have a fifth Thursday. So we're doing first one is uh, February 29th, Thursday night, 8.30 p.m. It is to collaborate. I'm going to highlight a ministry, somebody that's doing a program somewhere. They'll, you know, different times, they'll lead the thing. Okay, and it'll give us an opportunity to find out what's working, figure out what's not. Who's having troubles getting in the Eucharist? What solutions have we had? I know someone mentioned that at Putnam. Well, I was able to tell him today that Deacon Corky, through the Catholic Lawyers Guild, helped us overcome the battle without having to go to legal, without having to pay, you know, pay a lawyer or sue them yet. We threatened them because a year is long enough. You know, three, three months, okay, figure your stuff out. Four months, no, a year, just because you don't believe what we don't believe, you have no right to deny them the Eucharist. Here's your letter. And you have to do that. And so a way for us to collaborate and figure this stuff out together. For those, I think in my packet, I realized I did not put my uh, email, or maybe I did, but if I didn't, uh, through the app that hopefully you guys have already downloaded in the day, or we'll go download right now, you'll be able to get my information. And also, uh, not only for you guys, for those of you that are in a place to donate to the ministry, or invite others into the ministry through donation. Not everyone can or wants to give their time to going in, but they do want to. I get asked all the time, how can we contribute? There's a QR code uh, for them to be able to donate to the ministry, uh, which will help with our uh, un continuing ongoing programs. Uh, I'm in prayer discernment, trying to do the communication with the right people for a potential golf tournament in the fall. And with that, I'd love to take any questions. John, uh, you donations. Yes. Have idea what the would be for. Absolutely. So right now, a lot of us sitting in an account. What we'll go over over there, and it's kind of meant more for over there, is a lot of the materials that we used for the first part of the ministry, which is going and visiting in, in prison. Okay, this is an evangelistic material, it's dismiss studies, it's prayer material, rosaries, all that kind of stuff. Um, but also, one of the things I wanted to do and didn't because I wanted Father Martin to have this first talk was, hey, let's get everyone a, um, what's it called? Not a lanyard. Uh, I said earlier, that holds the Eucharist? Burst, thank you, burst, the burst, okay? But you, you probably want to get your own burst. Yeah, hold on one sec, yeah. And so, um, great question. Other things are to support or sponsor fellows going into Trinity Rescue Mission and Operation New Hope. And that is only gonna happen through all of us collaborating and saying, Okay, we recommend Joe Schmo here to Trinity Rescue Mission and, and, and continuing to build these relationships. But we want to start not only recommending, but sponsoring and helping these institutions out. I want to be able to buy them a $12,000 freezer so that they can feed those that they are taking care of at their institution. Um, 
funding things like, uh, again, there was someone here I know wants to remain anonymous that, that sponsored, help us be able to re reserve this theater. This theater set 300 people. Talk about an opportunity to evangelize. Not only our salvation history, but guess what? I get some time to, to plug some other groups that want to plug their, their information. But we get to plug jail and prison ministry and what we're doing in there. And it'll be another opportunity for them, uh, for people to, to donate. Yes. Are the other parishes, are they getting pushed emails with this information? I just found out on Monday that we got the approval. So, and I put all my energy into this. So it's all going out this, uh, here within the next week and two. Okay. What I know is I got 300 seats to fill. I will fill 300 seats. So any help you can do that, uh, with that. And, uh, in your, in your, uh, pamphlet, is information that I do have right now. If they donate that, there's a place you put notes. So once you select your missionary ministry and all that kind of stuff, you want it to go to that, you know, other ways. But to answer your question, we will get the information out and I will have an answer to you uh, more direct here by the end of the week. And that's what I'm hoping to have this first meeting on the 29th so we can go over some of these, some of these things. Yes. Yes, our goal is to not sell tickets. This is evangelistic. Jail and prison ministry, we are evangelizers. These are going to be free tickets, donation. Donation. So we're getting sponsors. We're having people donate. But the people we, we have coming, I hope, are a lot of you folks that we get to celebrate the passion of our Lord together. But it's also evangelistic in nature, sharing the mission of what we're, what, what we're doing in jail and prison ministry. So my hope is to not charge for tickets, but for people to sponsor. And, and uh, again, I'm working with this guy. I just got the information. So I'm I don't want to speak out of turn. I was hoping to get like a Jim Caviezel signed t-shirt out, you know, for the, the problem is with free registration is if I don't have any investment in it, then I might not come. I don't want an empty theater either. So. What is your goal for that program? Dollar amount. What, what are you hoping to raise for that event? Great question. Um, I just de-escalated myself and my own ego because at first I was going for the TransUnion Center, which seated 3,000 people. <laughs> And, uh, and so my supervisor said, let's do this first test run. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I, I would love to make $20,000 out of this deal, you know, for, for saying this is what we're going to do. You know, I, I, I can't wait for this meeting with, uh, I, I talked with Dustin, uh, Father Dustin, sorry, uh, this weekend. Um, just again about our meeting and he went on and on and talked to the secretary there and went on and on about what they're doing and we want to partner with you guys in helping people duplicating what we're doing and so right now I have no idea the cost this is this is level one but I said I'm why am I gonna wait till next year good Friday is right now let's get let's get step step one done in that process, we'll, we'll blow that out of the water. We'll figure out our golf tournament. Golf tournament, guess what? How many wouldn't love golfing with our brothers and sisters at Trinity Rescue Mission and Operation New Hope who are at the holes welcoming people as you're golfing? They do that in Operation Yes. And they get a ton of money. Awesome. How awesome would that be? Awesome. And they have placards with their names and all the stuff that they're getting to do with where they work. It's a big event. Heck yeah. Great. Tell them we're in. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. How are we getting involved in the ministry? Do we go on to this app and fill out the, the questions?
questions and will you contact us by email or so? Yes, we'll, we'll have some back and forth. First of all, I, I got your information today, but we need to have a, a direct conversation as to, hey, where are you living? Where would you like to get involved? Is it jail, is it prison, all that kind of stuff. But all the information is there provided for you so that if, hey, I know I want to help in the prisons, you can start the application process. So like we did today, you got fingerprints. That's been a bigger stumbling block to us. A lot of people, because they have to get fingerprints, won't do that. So we wanted to provide that for you today. That wasn't free, right? Is, and so what are the funds going for? That, $75, again, this isn't $75 show-up fee. This is considered after hours, $75 more dollars. Well, someone's paying. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just saying free ain't free, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Freedom ain't free. So, um, but yes, that's all there for you to go ahead and begin the process because there's a, a timing issue. So this is how you can say you threw your application out. Is that way? Yep. Okay. Super, you guys. Take a little break. Get some water. We're meeting over there, and it's all hashing everything out. I, what I want going on over there is we're going to figure out who's where. We're going to all sign in. Uh, Yes, you've already signed it. Sign a new piece of paper in front of the jail or the prison that's got a folder out over there. I want a good solid list of who's on your team. If your teammates aren't here, let us know. Because we want to grow this and expand this. We're going to figure out where we have gaps. What I do know is right now at Mayo, at Hamilton, and why am I keep forgetting the main one I just visited? Swanee. Okay. There is not a Catholic volunteer. I got to go out to St. Uh, uh, Francis Xavier this last weekend and, and Pope talk. I had one of uh, uh, Spanish fellows come out with me and talk to that population. And how many of you guys came today from your parish? Three. Three people. St. Saint Francis. Awesome. So we're going to get them on board. We're going to help them get their pastor on board. But heck. Who doesn't want to take a day trip? You know, I might take some planning, go drive two hours out to Hamilton or Suwannee or, or Mayo and serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're going to plan all of that over there uh, and just, it's, it's, a, it's a session coming together. I'll share a little bit about uh, letter writing, but I've gone long here and we've also got to get ready for mass with Bishop Estevez. So get going. God bless you.